Our scripture for this morning can be found in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and we will begin to read with verse 26. Luke chapter 1, and beginning to read with verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of Jacob, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son, and and this is the sixth month month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So all of the hymns that we sang this morning had some reference to our faith in the uh, virgin birth of Christ. And I wanted to begin the sermon this evening as asking all of us as modern people, do we believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ? Now, clearly, this in the history of the church has been an important doctrine, and that's reflected in the fact that in the uh, two historic creeds that we occasionally uh, recite in our church, the Apostles' Creed, And the Nicene Creed, both of them make reference to this as a key doctrine, a key teaching of the church. And so in the Apostles' Creed, we confess that we believe that Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. In the Nicene Creed, we affirm that he was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. And so these creeds are 1900 and 1700 years old, And so for the entire history of the church, the church has confessed that we believe in the virgin birth of Christ. So what should we think about this in our supposedly scientific age? Is this uh, an embarrassment from our uh, primitive past that maybe we should shy away from? Or is it in fact true? Should we kind of be quiet about it? Or should we boldly proclaim it as an evidence for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints? Those of you that know me and our congregation, um, I think, would guess what our answer to those questions would be. But in an age when many across our culture have forgotten Christian truth claims and have forgotten the way that we defend those truth claims, it is imperative upon us to, be st- to stand ready to defend the faith that has been bequeathed to us. And so it's in that spirit that I want to talk this morning about the idea that we believe in the virgin, bo- in the virgin born son. We believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. So first of all, from our text, Think with me about the virgin and the son. And let's read again verses 26 and tw- uh, twenty-six through 28. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph 
of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now in verse 26, it mentions that this was the sixth month. That does not mean that it was the sixth month of a calendar year, as they would have understood it, but it was the sixth month since the same angel Gabriel had appeared to Zechariah, the husband of Elizabeth, who was Mary's relative, and said to Zechariah, guess what, your wife is pregnant and is going to have a baby. And of course, that would be John the Baptist who would be born after that. So six months after Zechariah received the appearance from Gabriel, Gabriel then appears to Mary with uh, a different and new message. The pregnancy of Elizabeth is presented in Luke's Gospel as paralleling the, the announcement of Jesus' um, conception in several ways, but always with an emphasis that what was happening with Jesus was even more exceptional and more great. And so the, the, the pregnancy of Elizabeth was unexpected. They had been trying to have a baby and had decided that she was barren, that they would never have children. And lo and behold, then she's pregnant with the one who would be John the Baptist. And so it was unexpected, uh, but not really anything like what happened with Mary, who was still a virgin and was told that she would have a child. In chapter 1 and verse, eight, uh, verse 15, excuse me, we read of John the Baptist that he was great in the sight of the Lord. In verse 32 of the text that we read, we read that Jesus is described as great without any qualification. John would be uh, the one who, uh, his father was told, would make ready for the Lord a people prepared. But Jesus would be that Lord for which John was preparing them. John would be known as the son of Zechariah, but Jesus is described as sitting forever on the throne of his father David while also being the son of God. And so there are parallels in the way that, Jacob, that Gabriel spoke to Zechariah and the way that he spoke to Mary, but in every instance, the birth of Jesus and the one who is coming is described in terms that would present him as far greater. Now, what should we say about Mary uh, herself? As we know, there are certain Christian groups, denominations, that venerate Mary in, we would say, excessive ways. And because of that, some have tended to shy away from recognizing what a remarkable young woman Mary really was. According to cultural conventions at the time, when these things happened to Mary, she was probably about 15 years old. Uh, the betrothals in that culture happened very young, and so she was likely in her mid-teens. Think about that. Even by the time of Jesus' crucifixion, she was still alive then, and at the crucifixion, she still would have been in her late 40s. She was a young woman when she, uh, still, at least by my standards, she was a young woman when she witnessed this son uh, taken on a cross and crucified for the sins of mankind. Both she and David, I mean, uh, both she and jo Joseph were descendants of David, and so they were, uh, they were uh, in the uh, line of monarchy, but they were way, well down uh, the chain of succession. There was no danger that if Israel had uh, a restoration of their monarchy, there was no uh, danger that Joseph would be named king. They were uh, a poor young couple. And she is said to have been betrothed to Joseph, and, and often in our day that is compared to an engagement. Um, actually, betrothal was more serious than that. And, and for Joseph to break off the betrothal, which he considered doing when he learned that Mary was pregnant, uh, to break off the betrothal would have required something uh, similar to a divorce. And so, in some ways, it was similar to our engagements, and, but in some ways, it was more serious. All of this took place in Nazareth. 
if you're going to stage an event to change the world, you probably wouldn't do it in Nazareth. In Rome, nobody knew where Nazareth was. In Cairo, nobody knew where Nazareth was. In none of the great cities did they know where Nazareth was. When Jesus was an adult and was introduced to Nathanael, and it was mentioned that he came from Nazareth, Nathanael said, can anything good come from Nazareth? In the Old Testament, does anybody have any guesses how many times Nazareth is mentioned in the Old Testament of even the Hebrew Bible? Zero. Nazareth doesn't even uh, garner an um, a mention in the Hebrew Old Testament. And so it was not much of a backwater village. And yet that's where all of these events occurred that ultimately would change the history of the world and ultimately actually change eternity. And so Mary here is described as finding favor or in some translations, finding grace with God. Uh, some have taken these to mean that she had some kind of level of perfection that God had an unusual grace upon her because she was better than others in her town. But actually the word grace or favor has the idea, same idea with regard to Mary that it would have with regard to any of us. If God does something of special blessing on us, we know that he's given to us grace that we did not deserve. It's just God's goodness. And so it was with Mary. Mary was a woman of faith. Mary was a woman of courage. We see that throughout this story, and we don't want to diminish that. And yet, in selecting her as the one who would bear the Son of God, um, God was giving to her a, an unusual blessing, not one that she deserved, but one that was given to her by God's grace. And so we've seen the virgin and the son. Uh, but second, I would have you to notice with me the verity of the story. What are we to make of this claim in, here, in this passage, in Matthew's Gospel hinted at in other places throughout the Bible. Isaiah 7, 14 clearly prophesied it. What are we to make of this claim that Jesus was born of a virgin, that a virgin gave birth to the Son of God? Now, some wise modern guy can come to us and confidently assure us that this story is biologically impossible. Well, duh. That's hard, that hardly requires brain sur a brain surgeon to tell us that it's biologically impossible for a virgin to bear a son. That doesn't require a modern scientist. In our text, Mary knew it. And we see Mary's confusion when the angel Gabriel tells her, uh, Mary says in verse 34, how will this be since I am a virgin? She knew where babies came from 2,000 years ago. And so this isn't a modern quandary. Joseph, in Matthew's gospel, was confused. And he didn't believe in it till he got a visit from an angel. Virgins don't have babies. And throughout the history of the world, this has been known. This is not a modern discovery of recent biologists. And yet, as we've said for 2,000 years, the Christian church has believed this. So what, what's the answer to the modern scientist other than making fun of him for telling us the obvious? Well, the thing that we should say to him is that the problem that he is having is not with science. The problem is with philosophy and with unproved assumptions that he doesn't seem to be aware of, the unproved assumption is what we call naturalism, or the idea that nature is all there is. And if nature is all there is, then guess what? The scientist is right. You can't have a virgin birth if nature 
is all there is. We can all shut the lights off and go home and not come back. But as Christians, we don't understand the world as involving nature and nothing else. Nature is not all there is. There is a God in heaven who is all-powerful and about whom it can be said that there is nothing impossible with him. And so if you believe in God, if you believe in a God who is not just distant way out there, but who is engaged in this world in which we live, then we don't have the problem that the naturalist thinks that we should have. God is real. He is in this world, and he does in the world what um, he wills. And so uh, the problem of the, of the modern naturalist is easy to answer. Your naturalism is not proven. It's an assumption. And we counter with the understanding, with the belief, and we think there's good evidence for our belief, but it is also an assumption on which we look to, to evidence to confirm. But we believe that there is a God who is here, who is real, and that can do anything in the world that he chooses to do. Now, those that don't believe in the virgin birth have to come up with ideas about where the story came from. Luke wrote this gospel around the, in the early 80s, 60s, roughly 30 years after the crucifixion of Christ. So within 30 years, Luke, who was traveling the world, he would have written this from Rome. Luke is elaborating on this story of the virgin birth that evidently had widespread belief by that time. Well, where did this story come from if it wasn't true? And so there are different theories that skeptics give. Some say that, well, this is just another of the Bible's miraculous stories about childbirth. Isaac born to Sarah and Abraham, that was a miraculous story. Uh, Samson, his birth to a barren couple was miraculous. Samuel, uh, he was born to a barren mother after she prayed at the uh, tabernacle. John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1, we have all these stories of unusual, unexpected births. And Jesus is just another one. Except the birth of Jesus was not like any of those others. They were born to women that had given up on being able to have a baby. But all of those came into the world the usual way. All of us know stories in our own times just like these. Couples want to have a child. They try for years to get pregnant. They can't. They might even seek medical attention. And at some point, they, realize, they just decide it's not going to happen for us. And then after they've, decided, after they've given up, then <laughs> the wife shows up pregnant. But most all of us, I suspect, have heard stories like that. And they are just mysteries as to why things happen in that way. But that's a very different thing, either in biblical times or in our time. That's a very different thing from a 15-year-old virgin showing up pregnant. The stories are not at all the same and should not be regarded as the same. Now, there are others that say that Christians stole this story. They stole it from the pagans because we know that Christians just love pagan stories and just borrow from them all the time. Uh, no, <laughs> that's not the way it worked. And actually, these theories have been discredited so that even liberal theologians no longer believe them, but sometimes you still people try, see, see people trying to pass them off as possibilities. Again, in those stories about pagan gods interacting with human women and producing a child, um, it's, those stories always involve a misbehaving god. And there was something physical that happened that produced the child. Again, nothing like the biblical story. And so, so none of these explanations as to how the story of the virgin birth of Christ so quickly spread across the world as the gospel spread, none of the alternative theories really work all that well. Here's the best theory 
as to how the story spread. Mary was still alive at the time of the crucifixion and resurrection. We don't know how much longer um, she lived after that. The book of Acts doesn't track her um, after that period immediately after the resurrection, so we don't know. But we know that she was still alive at the time of the resurrection. There in Jerusalem with all the apostles. Who do you think told all the apostles the story? And so it was not easy, it was not difficult for Luke to say that he had eyewitness accounts of uh, what happened with Mary and how the angel spoke with her. And so these, this comes actually from a first-hand account. Mary telling to the apostles who explained to Luke, if Luke did not meet Mary himself, explained to him, this is what happened in the first place. And so this is a very ancient rendering that we are reading. This is Mary talking about her visit from the angel and what happened with her. And so when we talk about believing in the virgin birth, we are talking about something that's not discredited by science. It's not discredited by other theories of origin, but it rests on eyewitness testimony that we can put our faith in as accurately being conveyed in the Word of God. We are on solid ground, especially when we recognize that Mary's virgin-born son, if we had lived in Nazareth at the time, we probably wouldn't have believed her. But 30, 30 years later, he was crucified, and then he got up and walked out of the tomb. And when he walks out of the tomb, then we scratch our heads and we say, you know, Mary told us that story. This was somebody special. This was somebody different. And so we've seen the virgin and the son. We've seen the verity of the story. And finally, I would have you to notice with me what I'm calling the value of the Savior. We read in our, um, from our confession of faith earlier that the mediator had to be both God and man. And that's the reason for the virgin birth. The virginal conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit is something that's only happened one time in all of human history. And it will never happen again. And it only happened one time and will never happen again because it needed to happen once because of the uniqueness of the son that was born to her. He was somebody that was different from every other son that has been born in the history of the world. And so as described to Mary and elaborated on over the course of the New Testament, we know several things about Jesus. He was a divine person. He was the son of God. As a divine person, he had a divine nature. And in his conception, this divine son with a divine nature took on a human nature so that he was both God and man without separation between the two natures or without confusion of the two natures. And so he was a divine person. He was the son of God. He possessed in one person two natures, both son of God and son of man. In our text that we read, we see this alluded to. He is described as the son of his father, David. Thus, he was fully human. And he is described here as the son of God. Thus, he was fully God. All of this was necessary for our eternal salvation. As God, he represented God to us. And as man, he represented us to God. In Romans 5, and then again in 1 Corinthians 15, we see this one that was born of the virgin described as a specific kind of man, a representative man. Uh, the Reformed theologians speak of him as uh, the federal second Adam as opposed to the first Adam. In the Garden of Eden, the first Adam failed in the meritorious covenant he made with God, don't eat of this tree and you'll not die. Eat of the tree and you'll die. 
Adam in the garden of paradise ate and died along with all of his progeny. Jesus met Satan in the wilderness in a barren land, not a garden. And Jesus confronted by Satan with the same kinds of temptations that he had presented to Adam. Jesus succeeded and overcame the devil, whereas Adam failed. When Adam failed, he plunged the entire human race into sin, corruption, and condemnation. When Jesus succeeded, he provided for his people victory over sin. And the one who provided victory over sin then took punishment upon himself for the sins of others on the cross. He had no sins of his own, but he bore the punishment that we deserved because of ours. With no sin of his own, he satisfied the sin debt of all who were his. And that's kind of a summary of what we find in Romans 5. In 1 Corinthians 15, we find a further elaboration on the first Adam, second Adam analogy. It is said that Adam became a life-giving spirit, or that Jesus uh, became the second Adam, uh, give, uh, becoming a life-giving spirit, providing resurrection life, eternal life, to all who are his. And so because Jesus was the representative, the second Adam for all of his people, all of his people are guaranteed along with him to have resurrection life not just in this world, but in the world to come. All of this talk about Son of God, Son of Man, Son of David, Son of God, first Adam, second Adam, all of this makes sense in light of the, of the virgin birth. In the womb of Mary, God entered the world in human flesh. That baby born in Bethlehem, talked about before that in Nazareth, became the savior of the entire world. Do you believe in the virgin birth? Some on the liberal side of Christianity talk about it as though it's a past relic of the faith. Even some who say now that they would believe in it seem a little bit embarrassed by it. And yet this is not a tangential matter of the Christian faith. It is a central matter of our faith. The story that started in the backwater village of Nazareth has spread across and changed the entire world. Think about that. It started in Nazareth. It wasn't even significant enough to get a single mention in the Old Testament. It started in Nazareth. And now there are Christians in College Station. New York and Los Angeles and San Francisco and Tokyo and Moscow and across the Middle East and down into Africa and across Europe. There are Christians all over the world and it all started in Nazareth with a message that an angel gave to a young woman who would be a mother. It changed the entire world. If we believe in the virgin birth, we should not treat it as a sentimental story to be pulled out in December along with the Christmas decorations. But rather, we should understand that this is life-changing and world-changing stuff. What a gracious God who would enter the world in this way, leaving the praising songs of the angels for the painful suffering and pernicious slanders that this world had to offer. What a gracious God who would embrace suffering in the person of the Son as Christ did that we might have life, that we might have eternal life through his name. As Christians, we must believe in his birth. We must believe in his life. We must believe in his death. We must believe in his resurrection. We must believe in his ascension and session. And in so believing, we are saved.